It is time for the entire history of Halo since before Halo Combat evolved all the way through Halo Infinite. I've done this for Battlefield and Apex Legends and man, Halo being my favorite franchise of all time, this video was inevitable. Like always, there are timestamps in the description below. Use them if you'd like. I'll also be releasing the complete story and lore of Halo video soon, and I promise it won't disappoint, so subscribe if you're interested in that as we finish the campaign of Halo Infinite. All right, it's time. Now you might think that the original Halo, Halo Combat Evolved was the first Halo game, to which you would technically be correct, but not quite. First, there were the precursors to Halo. No, no, not those yet. I meant Marathon, Myth, and Monkey Nuts. Bungie's first two successful franchises were the first person shooter Marathon in 1994 and real time strategy Myth in 1997. Marathon was a Macintosh's answer to the PC's doom, but it took the relatively young first person shooter genre at the time and added physics, dual weapon wielding, networked multiplayer, and a story with objectives. He played as a nameless cyborg security officer in Mjolnir Mark IV armor, revived from stasis to defend the UESC Marathon from alien incursion with the help of increasingly unstable, rampant AIs. Sound familiar? <laughs> Myth was a real-time strategy fantasy game without resource management or building construction, but Bungie's design team thought Myth would have done better if it were sci-fi like StarCraft. So as Myth 2 was coming out, there was a small group within Bungie that started working on a new project called Monkey Nuts, which was the code name for Halo. Well, only for a week because the project lead Jason Jones didn't want to have the awkward conversation with his parents that they were working on a game called Monkey Nuts, so they renamed it to Blam. Blam was another RTS game like Myth, but it was sci-fi themed and took place on a distant Dyson Sphere planet called Solipsis. Controlling the troops felt a bit boring, so they changed the game to be a third person running gun shooter. Other things changed over time too, with the planet going from a Dyson Sphere to a ring and Humvees becoming warthogs. Oh, and you could ride around on naked chocobo looking creatures called blind wolves too. The name of the game went from Blam to Crystal Palace, Hard Vacuum, Star Maker, Star Shield, The Sand Machine, and more, but it eventually landed on Halo. And so did Master Chief for the first time in 1998, three years before the game would release. Uh, Chief looked a little different back then with an assault rifle strapped across his back and his visor being, uh... <laughs> And there were things like the Ancient Flamethrower, Retractable Sword, Spear Gun, Gravity Wrench, Helicopter, and even a boat called the Doozy. Fast forward a few years and Microsoft whipped out its big black uh, box at E3 in 2001. And you'll be able to get a box just like this with Xbox in it. <laughs> oh man, if he didn't tell us there would be an Xbox in there, I'd be so lost. <laughs> But the flagship game was Halo Combat Evolved, and if it failed, it could have marked the beginning and end of Xbox. Oh no. Recon reporting. Hostiles have been neutralized. Say again? Over. The drop zone is clear. I repeat, the drop zone is clear. But Halo had other plans. Before it even released, everybody was talking about how this new game from Bungie evoked feelings of adventure and exploration within a very interesting world with the freedom to go anywhere. It looked and sounded different, and after it was presented at Macworld by Steve Jobs, it went absolutely viral and became one of the five most anticipated games on three continents. The composer for the Halo soundtrack, Marty O'Donnell, knew that no matter what people thought about game music, there was something about getting a melodic hook or jingle stuck in someone's head that was incredibly powerful for branding, and he was right. Not only did Halo bring a sense of adventure, stunning visuals, and epic music, but also a smooth gameplay experience with memorable alien architecture, enemies, weapons, and vehicles in an open environment. Back then, most first-person shooters were tunnel-based, resulting in claustrophobic experiences, but Halo was mostly the complete opposite. Finding an interesting enemy like the Covenant with their variety of elites, grunts, jackals, and hunters made combat different every time, and after getting your heart pumping from the flood jump scare, it introduced a whole new element to the story that made you want to explore more. Cutscenes were also impressive, playing out as intense action scenes, dramatic reveals, galaxy impacting events, and even horror at times. There was so much wonder there, and around it was groundbreaking gameplay to support. 
with it being an Xbox exclusive game, it had to feel good on a controller, which was not typical for FPS games at the time. Most for mouse and keyboard input, so Bungie developed things like aim assist and bullet magnetism, and simplified the controls to toggle between two weapons with the press of the Y button instead of cycling through an inventory. This made the game simpler so that it could be enjoyed by any person that was picking up an Xbox controller for the first time, and within five months, over a million copies of Halo had been sold, and for every other Xbox that was sold, so was a copy of Halo. It was just that popular. Gameplay consisted of you playing as Master Chief with a motion tracking radar, rechargeable energy shield with a health bar that wouldn't replenish without finding a health pack, and a simple HUD displaying the rounds left in your weapon, grenade count, up to 8 total back then, and battery life left on your flashlight. The physics were fun with stacking a ton of grenades under a warthog and launching it or you across the map. Fall damage existed, and there was the double melee with grenade, reload glitch, crouch jumping was crucial, grenades were used to launch weapons to you, or if you timed it right, you could grab weapons through the floor. Grenade jumping was used to reach new heights, and of course, everyone fell in love with that dang pistol. This thing was so powerful because it had a zoom, decent magazine size, and would kill with one headshot on unshielded enemies. Other UNSC weapons included the assault rifle, shotgun, sniper rifle, rocket launcher, and on PC, which was released a couple years later, the flamethrower. Covenant weapons available to use were the plasma rifle, plasma pistol, and needler. There was also the energy sword, but you weren't able to use it due to a built-in failsafe by the Covenant, and the fuel rod gun would explode when the Covenant wielder was killed. The fuel rod would be later available though for PC players on most multiplayer maps. Vehicles included the Warthog, Scorpion Tank, Ghost, and Banshee, and I guess the Wraith, although you couldn't drive it, and because of how the physics engine worked in-game, it wasn't able to tell what a fast-moving vehicle was from a slow-moving vehicle, so even the slightest nudge would result in a splatter. Grenades were limited to frags and plasmas, and the two classic power-ups were the Overshield and Active Camouflage. If you had a friend with you, there was also campaign co-op, which made the experience easily twice as fun. You could even play with up to four players on a single screen, which resulted in someone screen peeking, and if you ever died, it's because they must have been peeking. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, four players in a game was great, but if you had four Xboxes and set up a local area network, or LAN for short, with something called System Link, you could play with up to 16 people in a game. Some of my favorite maps I remember were Battle Creek, Hang 'em High, Wizard, Sidewinder, and good old Blood Gulch. Nothing beat running around with a sniper, headshotting, and finishing your friends with the fine art of teabagging. The PC version I mentioned released in 2003 with online multiplayer, new maps and game modes, and the Rocket Warthog, with an expansion called Halo Custom Edition, which allowed players to browse and play user-created content and maps created with modding kits. Halo had a lot of different communities around it, with some inspiring montages and short films such as Rooster Teeth's Red vs. Blue series. The reception of the game received universal acclaim, which was good because it was probably the most important launch for any console ever. In 2003, Halo 2 came in hot at E3, but behind the scenes had serious issues that would result in several delays. I won't show the full reaction to the E3 demo, but people were amazed to see the sequel to a game they loved with an updated graphics engine and especially dual wielding. Bungie also made an entire new physics engine called Havoc in Halo 2, so everything about how vehicles, projectiles, and the environment interacted was changed. The lighting model was also updated, and after the E3 demo, the team realized they had a serious problem on their hands. With all the new updates they had made for Halo 2, the game wouldn't run on the Xbox. Two years of work were thrown in the trash, and the entire team banded together and pulled insanely long hours to meet the release date around one and a half years later. Because of the time crunch, the third act of Halo 2's campaign had to be cut entirely. Bungie wanted to do something unexpected with Halo 2 and give people a view on the Halo world that they didn't think they'd get. So we got to see the universe not only from Master Chief's perspective, but also from the Covenants as the Arbiter. Interestingly, for 97% of the game's development apparently, the Arbiter was actually called the Dervish. But because Dervish was associated with Islam and times were complicated due to 9-11, Bungie decided to rename him the Arbiter at the last second. The third act of the campaign that got cut from Halo 2 was meant to be Master Chief and the Arbiter coming together and defeating the Prophets and discovering the Ark and the deeper secret inside of it. The story was meant to culminate and end on Earth. 
That was how Halo was supposed to end, but because they didn't have enough time, the unpopular decision was made to have the final mission be played from the Arbiter's perspective and then leave everyone on the ball-busting cliffhanger of Master Chief saying his famous line and cutting to black. Sam, can anyone hear me? Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. The Halo 2 crunch had affected Bungie employees in ways nobody knew. People were sleeping in the office for days at a time and weeks at a time leading up to the release. One person had to kennel their dog for two straight months, divorces happened, and eventually they ran out of time. The game went live in November of 2004, servers for Xbox Live were fired up, and the game launched in a terrible state. Weapon balancing for single player weapons were carried over into multiplayer and it was completely broken for several weeks. Eventually, patches were done and Halo 2 soon became one of the greatest multiplayer experiences of all time. The team was beyond burnt out though, with several key people leaving Bungie, including the lead for the franchise, and almost everyone wanted to end the series with Halo 3. Now, from our perspective as gamers though, Halo 2 was amazing. Skulls and Easter eggs in the campaign added more of a reason to adventure around, but most impressive was the multiplayer. Sure, it had been delayed a couple of times and the multiplayer was unbalanced for a bit, but we didn't know of all the turmoil at Bungie or how much content they had cut from the game to meet the deadline. Compared to nowadays where the same thing happens with game development, but they end in disaster releases, it's a miracle that Halo 2 wasn't dead on arrival. Halo 2 could be played online with Xbox Live or through split screen and system link LAN connections. Matchmaking was new though, where players would choose the type of match they'd want to play and then the game would select a map and game type and automatically match players in a lobby. This kept a steady flow of games available at all times and was considered revolutionary at the time. It also allowed for the skill-based ranking system of 1 to 50. Ranks were based purely on wins and losses, meaning in-game performances like kill-death ratio, flag caps, bomb plants, hills capped, and whatever else meant nothing. It was all about if your team won or not. And they made the last seven ranks look different too because of the reference to Bungie's favorite number, seven. You could also join clans in Halo 2 to match up against other clans and custom games were a huge hit among the community. If you've never heard the words 1v1 me shoddy snipes on lockout, the term BXR, noob combo, snords, lag switch, or getting standby, knew how to super jump on any map, rocket sword fly, the ghost of lockout, zombies on foundation, dummy glitching as an invisible elite, insta teleporting using the passenger seat on a warthog, the giant spartan on burial mounds, the scarab gun, or had someone press X to delay the damn countdown as soon as the timer hit zero before the match, then I don't think you ever played Halo 2. There were several new gameplay mechanics like dual wielding and hijacking vehicles. Dual wielding allowed for various combinations of UNSC and Covenant weapons trading accuracy, the use of grenades and melee attacks for raw firepower. You could mix and match a lot of these new weapons too and people got pretty hyped up about dual wielding their SMGs. I'm dual wielding my SMGs I'm gonna go on a killing spree You better not try to mess with me cause I'm Energy shields were stronger and recharged at a faster rate compared to Halo CE, but health acted differently. Health in Halo 2 replenished after your shield was fully regenerated, which was attributed to a new biofoam dispenser in the Spartan armor. The only power-ups were still the overshield and active camouflage, and new weapons included the battle rifle, SMG, sentinel beam, beam rifle, carbine, brute plasma rifle, and brute shot, with new vehicles being the Goss Warthog and Spectre. Default maps that launched for arena play were Ascension, Beaver Creek, Colossus, Foundation, Ivory Tower, Lockout, and Midship, with big team battle maps being Burial Mounds, Coagulation, Headlong, Waterworks, and Zanzibar. Several map packs released as DLC, bringing favorites like Warlock, Sanctuary, Turf, Containment, Relic, and Terminal, among others. Offline LAN tournaments organized by local groups in the MLG also blossomed with Halo 2 with memorable names like Ogre 1, Ogre 2, Walshi, Karma, Gandhi, and teams like Carbon, Straight Rippin', and Final Boss. The Halo 2 modding community also blew up in an odd way because you could install mods from your computer onto your Xbox through a program called Dot Halo and some hardware called Action Replay in the original Splinter Cell game. I wasn't sure how it worked, but I did it anyway. Countless hours in custom games with friends were spent flying around on Goss Warthog cannons, shooting grenades and rockets out of shotguns, and changing 
creating, or spawning in pretty much anything you could imagine. Like the first Halo, Halo 2 received critical acclaim with statements of it being the best multiplayer experience of the time, but some criticized the short campaign with a seemingly abrupt ending. Following the massive success of Halo 2, Bungie wanted to finish the grand trilogy in an epic fashion compared to the Lord of the Rings, but what followed was a mountain of work in undoing everything they had done on Halo 2. This was because Microsoft rolled out the Xbox 360 and had redone all of the underlying live systems, which broke everything across the board. Once again though, Bungie wanted to do more than they had done with Halo 2, and to surprise fans once again with features and story points that people wouldn't expect or even know that they wanted. They decided, What it really needs is some death. You actually want to get to the point where the player goes, well wait a minute, I've been this character for three games, they can't possibly kill me. By having the reality of death uh, a part of the story, it did actually introduce this tone of heroism. Johnson, sound off. The thought was that if some main characters died, it would make people feel like they would be at risk and in turn, their actions more heroic. It was decided that Miranda and Sergeant Johnson would be the lost souls and more than that, Johnson would be killed by 343 Guilty Spark, who you thought was your buddy. Some at Bungie thought this was a massive mistake, but the writers wanted to have big stakes at the end, which they did. Master Chief had left Cortana with the Flood and Gravemine at the end of Halo 2. The Covenant had occupied Earth. The Elites and Brutes were destroying everything that the Prophet of Truth hadn't yet. All of the Halo rings were primed and ready to fire. The Flood were infesting everything, but at least you had the Arbiter to keep you some company. It was an epic story that made you feel like you were the only one in the universe that could finish the fight, battling on top of scarabs and elephants, using the new equipment and weapons like the shoulder-fired Spartan laser, missile pods, flamethrowers, two new grenade types with spike grenades and incendiaries, a gravity hammer, brute spikers, and new vehicles like the Hornet, Mongoose, Brute Chopper, and Brute Prowler. But that was just your typical new stuff with a Halo game. What nobody expected were features from small things like being able to veto a map or the player population map. Shout out to those faint lights around the world. We always wondered who you were and we dearly missed your lights as they went out over time. To massive features like armor customization, theater, revamped custom games and forge mode. And perhaps least expected and most unsettling of all was how Master Chief was left adrift in space at the end of the campaign. People really didn't know if Halo 3 was the end of the story or not at the time, and it was honestly unsettling. But back to the new features. Theater allowed you to save films or screenshots from campaign, multiplayer, and forge. You could watch from first person, third person, or a bird's eye view of anything that happened in a match, and this feature was huge for making machinima style videos and montages. Clips and screenshots were shared with friends, and some of the favorites were even featured by Bungie on their favorites page. Forge mode could honestly be its own video entirely, but it was an object editor that lets you modify multiplayer maps, changing things like spawn points, weapons, vehicles, teleporters, and properties of the map. The most creative maps were featured on Forge Hub, and some of the best player creative maps were even put into matchmaking. The game modes that were enabled by Forge and custom games like Mongoose Racing, Griff Ball, Parkour Courses, Infection, Duck Hunt, Tower of Power, D-Day, Fat Kid, Conquest, and countless others added so much depth to Halo 3 that there was always something new to try. Forge was ingenious and revolutionary to the Halo franchise and added years of player-made content. To market the epic game that was Halo 3 before it launched, there were also these awe-inspiring cinematics like Starry Night, which was a commercial during the Super Bowl, flashing back to John's childhood and contrasting that to his current life as Spartan 117 with the Bubble Shield teaser. The Assault Rifle was also back, which fans had longed for after it was missing from Halo 2. Then there was the Believe campaign that kicked off with the Museum of Humanity, which still gives me chills watching it. It featured a live action interview with a UNSC retired major that fought in the Battle of New Bombasa alongside Master Chief where he reminisces about his memories of the inspiring hero. There were several similar testimonials with one of them discussing the supposed death of Master Chief and his gravesite. Where's Master Chief's grave? I don't think anyone really knows. There was a ceremony five years ago over there just as a symbolic gesture. The coffin was empty. Why was the coffin empty? No Spartan could be listed as KIA. They could only be listed as MIA, missing. 
The communication from Bungie was also superb, with releases of many video documentaries of the process of developing Halo 3 and why they chose to do things certain ways for the campaign, multiplayer, custom games, and Forge. Halo was even supposed to have a movie directed by Peter Jackson, which never saw the light of day, but we did get some snippets of what it'd look like from Halo Landfall. With all the marketing, it was such an out-of-game experience that fans wanted more than just the Halo games. They wanted live-action shorts and movies, TV shows, books, anything to further explore the story and universe of Halo. It was a magical time, the likes of which I haven't experienced since. Halo 3 received critical acclaim upon release, with many stating that the game was everything we hoped for it would be, and much, much more. It was a game that was satisfying for everyone. People brand new to Halo, casuals, and even competitive MLG players all had a place within Halo 3 that they enjoyed. With all of Halo's success in the first-person shooter genre, Microsoft decided to branch the franchise off into real-time strategy in 2009 with Halo Wars. The first look at this new game was through the more serious lens of the new trailer depicting groups of elites and banshees in Spartan Team Omega. It was like nothing we'd seen before from a Halo game, and I was going to be in control of all of this? What? Take my parents' money! Halo Wars took place 21 years prior to Halo CE during the Human Covenant War and was developed by Ensemble Studios with single and co-op campaign, skirmish, and multiplayer. Because it was developed for the Xbox 360, it needed to have very simplified controls and mechanics compared to your standard RTS game that was typically played on mouse and keyboard. Various buildings were constructed centrally to bases around the map, offering resources, power, tech upgrades, and unit production. In the campaign, you controlled UNSC soldiers and vehicles against classic Covenant forces from grunts to ghosts, banshees, and scarabs. In multiplayer, you chose one of six leaders to play as for the UNSC or Covenant, including Captain Cutter, Sergeant Forge, Professor Anders, the Arbiter, Brute Chieftain, or Prophet of Regret, with each having their own unique features like super units, economic bonuses, unique units, and leader powers or hero units. Insurrectionist infantry controlled neutral bases until they were destroyed and built on by a player. Forerunner structures like teleporters, spires of healing, bonus reactors, and units like the Sentinels patrolled points of interest around the map, which offered rewards or units for capturing or controlling. The Flood were also found on certain maps with infected marines, grunts, jackals, fat zit carrier forms that had burst their infected load all over you, and swarms would fly around with bombers dropping growth pods full of infected to fight you. I found Halo Wars to be a ton of fun, and strategizing with friends before a match about which leader and type of build you were going to run was fresh and new for playing on console. Were you going to go for a Covenant leader style rush with mass banshees or a scarab rush with a bunch of engineers healing it, or were you going to play for the long game with things like Forge's grizzly tanks? Build orders were optimized, fun was had, and maybe some friendships were ruined, but in general, Halo Wars received positive reviews with praise to the simplistic controls, it had that Halo feel, and the variety across the leaders was relatively well balanced. The same year Halo Wars came out, so did the campaign expansion to Halo 3 called Halo ODST, and in Halo marketing fashion, an excellent live action movie. Halo 3 ODST was originally called Halo 3 Recon, and it was the first time Halo wouldn't feature Master Chief. Bungie wanted it to be an expansion pack with a new game mode called Firefight, some extra maps for Halo 3, and a short story campaign through the eyes of an ODST. The story actually took place during Halo 2 when the ship at New Mombasa took off and it shoved this group of ODSTs off course that were set to land together. Because you didn't play as a cybernetic super soldier master chief and were now just a highly trained human in some cool body armor, you were much more vulnerable and had to think about what you were doing a little bit more. The game was darker, new silence weapons were added, and dual wielding was out. Visor mode would scan the environment, outlining everything from buildings to plants, enemies, and objects to interact with. There was this cool map you could pull up, but the motion tracker radar was gone and the health bar made a return. It felt much different than the running gun mentality of playing as the Master Chief, and for some people they hated it, whereas others loved it. Firefight was a single or cooperative mode where up to four players would essentially battle through waves of Covenant enemies. Each wave meant new bad guys, five waves made up a round, and three rounds was a set. Gameplay modifying skulls could really mix things up too, but I'm just gonna let Sergeant Johnson explain. Sounds easy, huh? Wrong! See these skulls? All skulls on. When they activate, they turn a casual Covenant makeout session into a full-on test of your manly prowess. Catch makes the enemy toss grenades like it's going out of style. Black Eye, only way you're getting health back is to walk up and punch an alien in the chin. And the others, 
Let's just say they call them difficulty multipliers for a reason. Oh, I love him. There were 10 different battlefields to play through and people really enjoyed it. Halo 3 ODST was the top selling Xbox 360 game worldwide at the time and it received generally positive reviews with praise for its atmosphere, music, and story approach. Bungie also said it was probably the most fun they had ever had making a Halo game because they got to do new things with technology that wasn't breaking every day. But because they knew their future was with Destiny and Halo Reach was their final chapter of Halo because their contract with Microsoft was going to expire with the transition of the Halo franchise to the new team at 343 Industries with Halo 4, which that transition didn't go so well, but we'll cover that in Halo 4, we've got to talk about Reach first. Because Bungie didn't want to tackle the cliffhangerish ending of Halo 3, they thought it'd be more interesting to tell a story like Saving Private Ryan, but in the Halo universe with the events leading up to Halo CE on the planet of Reach. They wanted you to really care about the characters in the campaign, knowing that all of their fates were sealed by the Covenant inevitably glassing the planet. It worked. Noble Team was loved by many, with all but one being confirmed killed, I, I mean missing in action. The one that survived was the team's sniper, Jun, and he actually went on to help handpick the very first Spartan 4s. A lot of people did find it dumb though when Kat died to that single needle rifle shot. Reach's marketing with trailers like Deliver Hope was similar to Halo 3 but not quite as powerful or memorable, at least for me. It did set a different tone for the game, one that was grittier and darker. Firefight, Forge, and Theater all made a return in Halo Reach. Theater and Firefight remained mostly the same, with a few different game types available for Firefight, along with matchmaking and additional customization. Forge got quite a massive upgrade though, allowing players to more easily edit maps with things like object orientation snapping and geometry phasing. Coordinates could be assigned, some colors could be changed, although most of it still looked gray, and forge filters, in addition to the ones from Halo 3, could be combined or used separately to give the entire map a different look. There was also an entire map devoted to forge called the uh, Forge World, with distinctly different play spaces for people to build around or within. The sandbox was much larger in Halo Reach than it was in Halo 3, which led to some very creative custom games. What's most interesting to me about Halo Reach though was the reception at launch with regards to multiplayer. The competitive community hated Reach and the player base was really polarized on if the game was great or terrible. Nowadays everyone says Reach was great but back then it wasn't so true. New game mechanics like Weapon Bloom, no bleed through shield to health damage, the health system from Halo 3 ODST, Sprint, Jetpacks, and other armor abilities like Armor Lock threw competitive balancing completely out of whack. On top of these controversial changes were the removal of dual wielding, the Beam Rifle, Brute Chopper, Elephant, Hornet, Incendiary Grenades, and Spike Grenades. For the weapons that were dual wieldable in the past, they were now buffed to compensate. Third person assassination animations were added along with new weapons including the grenade launcher, DMR, needle rifle, concussion rifle, plasma repeater, plasma launcher, and focus rifle with the rocket hog, falcon, and remnant being new vehicles. Oh, and you can drive a forklift around or a space plane in the campaign. It was unexpected and so cool to experience controlled spaceship combat in Halo for the first time. Reach introduced a huge variety of customization options for armor as well with Options for helmets with different variants, visor colors, chest plates, shoulder pads, armor effects, and more. You can mix and match things however you wanted, with everything being unlocked after achieving a certain rank and enough credits. Credits were awarded at the end of a match based on an individual player performance instead of the win-loss system. They were also obtained from playing other things like Forge and Campaign. Interestingly, it was the first time you could use matchmaking with Campaign to find someone to run co-op with. A new ranked matchmaking system called the Arena was where you'd scratch that competitive itch by climbing the ladder from Steel to Onyx. It utilized a seasonal system with each one lasting a month until the next reset. Halo Reach not only reintroduced the race game type from Halo CE, but also new ones such as Invasion, Stockpile, and Headhunter. In certain game modes, the Elite character model was enabled, which was formidably larger with faster shield regeneration and the ability to regain health fully over time compared to Spartans, which were smaller and weaker, only regaining health to thirds over time without use of a health pack. Like all the Halo games before it, Halo Reach received critical acclaim, with many praising the new take on the Halo formula, but some criticizing that the game wouldn't really appeal to people that weren't already Halo fans. It was also the last we'd see of Bungie as we'd know them, because they were off to work on what they called their Halo killer, Destiny.
Now, I'm going to go a little bit out of order here for continuity's sake, because in 2011, Halo CE Anniversary came out, and in 2014, Halo The Master Chief Collection came out, along with Halo 2 Anniversary. In between 2011 and 2014 is obviously Halo 4 in 2012, so we'll get to that next. The Anniversary games were essentially enhancements on graphics, frame rate, audio, and restyled classic soundtracks of the prior Halo games. The CE version came with new achievements, in-game terminals, skulls, and online co-op, with the best feature being the ability to toggle between the updated graphics and the original with the press of a button. And of course, in the last legendary cutscene, instead of the Elite touching Johnson's booty, it happens the other way around. Come here, you motherfuckers! <laughs> Forge was available and so was Firefight, which took place on Installation 4, the second classic Halo level. It featured ODSTs that would help you out in your fight against the Covenant, and thankfully, there was no flood. Fast forward three years and the Halo Master Chief Collection released. Basically functioning as the Halo hub for all the past and even current Halo games, the Master Chief Collection was uh, a great idea at the time, but it was absolutely ridden with bugs and issues to the point where it was literally unplayable for some. Games would black screen, matchmaking times were very long, achievements wouldn't work, and the user interface would completely bug out sometimes. 343 kept trying to patch all the issues after launch for several weeks until they had to just be straight up with everyone and release a formal apology for the state of the game, assuring that the studio would continue their work on amending all the issues with the collection. A few weeks later, they offered players a month of Xbox Live Gold and exclusive in-game nameplates and avatars, as well as Halo 3 ODST and a remastered version of Halo 2's map Relic for free as compensation for the ongoing issues. Issues persisted though, and it wouldn't be until three and a half years later in mid-2018 that the collection would undergo an entire overhaul from the UI to game stability and a match composer that let players fine-tune their game selections until it was worthwhile. A year later, it was announced that the Master Chief Collection would be coming to PC with Halo Reach being the first game available, soon followed by Halo CE Anniversary, Halo 2 Anniversary, Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, and Halo 4 all spread out through the next year and a half. Seasons, which are basically battle passes, were eventually implemented into the Master Chief Collection late in 2019, bringing new unlockable cosmetics to each of the games within the collection. Players would earn season points and could spend them in any season of their choice to claim its rewards. At the time of recording, we're currently in the final season, Season 8, which was purposefully done to coincide with the release of Halo Infinite. Although the Master Chief Collection works well now, in 2014 it left a really bad taste in people's mouth when it came to the perception of this new company, 343 running the Halo franchise, and Halo 4 in 2012 wasn't great either. Halo 4 was 343's first attempt at a Halo game in what was considered the Reclaimer trilogy at the time. There was a ton of hype built up for the game with marketing firing on all cylinders across different trailers with Chief waking up from cryosleep in the ship after Halo 3 amongst all this Michael Bay destruction as a new story was teased with what looked like a colossal mechanical anus which we soon learned was the planet Requiem. Then, an entire web series called Forward Unto Dawn came out with episodes releasing each week during the summer before the release of Halo 4. It followed the story of Cadet Thomas Lasky at a military training academy 31 years before the events of Halo 4. The academy gets attacked by the Covenant, a lot of people die and fall from the sky, but of course, Lasky and his surviving squad are rescued by none other than Master Chief. Lasky is later seen as the captain of the UNSC Infinity, which is a major part of Halo 4's setting and campaign. 343 respected the original trilogy and those that worked on it, but because of that, nobody felt confident enough to deviate away from what core Halo was. There was a lack of leadership internally, and with only one main Bungie employee, Frankie, joining the 343 team, they were struggling. The team had big ideas, but they really just wanted to separate themselves from the Bungie era, so they did things like changing the way Master Chief looked, or the UNSC Forward Unto Dawn, and added a new enemy, the Didact and the Prometheans. In hindsight, 343 said they probably should have all worked on a faithful, unbelievably beautiful remake of Halo CE instead of the forward-thinking Halo 4 that they dreamt up. Fans didn't like that Halo looked different, and even 343 felt like Halo 4 was a pale imitation of past Halos. The campaign was lackluster, with run through a horde of enemies, press a button, rinse and repeat loop, but the story was actually quite good. 
Chief was becoming no longer just a quiet, stoic super soldier. He started talking more, and he explored his personal relationship and emotions with Cortana as he disobeyed orders from the UNSC. Instead of being a suit of armor with badass one-liners, you learn more about the man behind the visor, John. For Halo 4's multiplayer space, 343 took competitive, social, and casual and tried to jam them together like chocolate and peanut butter for an experience that would appeal to all player types. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful, and this rocked 343 as the multiplayer dropped off quicker than expected. You played as a Spartan 4 in war games aboard the UNSC Infinity with matchmaking creating lobbies of players with similar competitive skill rank. Loadouts were customizable, and with everyone having a plasma pistol ready to go, vehicles were constantly being immobilized. Armor abilities made a return with these new things called tactical packages and support upgrades, which added another layer of customization to your loadout. Random and personal ordnance drops were added too, but at first glance, they felt a bit like kill streaks from Call of Duty. New weapons included the railgun, sticky detonator, saw LMG, storm rifle, one shot, beat down, I mean bolt shot, suppressor, scatter shot, light rifle, incineration cannon, binary rifle, pulse grenade, and the new vehicle, the Mantis. It was a bit disappointing that there was no UNSC flying vehicle like the Falcon or Hornet from past games. Spartan Ops was a story-driven, episodic game mode that could be played solo or cooperatively. It was the replacement for Firefight from Halo Reach and Halo ODST. The first five episodes were delivered on a weekly basis following Halo 4's launch, and the final five episodes were released in early 2013. Each featured a cinematic and five objective-based missions. The people that quit Reach early came back to Halo 4 hoping it would go back to the series' roots, but it didn't, and only further alienated and polarized the fanbase. It sure didn't help that Call of Duty Black Ops 2 came out the same year either, and many left the Halo franchise entirely. Despite this, the game was still the best selling in the Halo franchise to date, receiving generally positive reviews with most praise being around the story of the campaign, but man, the multiplayer population declined so rapidly that peak daily player counts barely reached over 30,000 after 9 months. But hey, at least we got to see Chief's face. I kinda. Before Halo 5's release in 2015, two games called Halo Spartan Assault and Halo Spartan Strike came out. These games were basically made to be played on a phone, but Spartan Assault was also available on the Xbox 360 and Xbox One. Spartan Assault had single and multiplayer elements, but Spartan Strike was single player only. You played as a Spartan 4 from the top down as you gunned through Covenant and later Promethean enemies with basically unlimited ammo. The campaign mode was divided into chapters, then further subdivided into individual missions. In Spartan Assault, completing missions or rotating weekly challenges awarded credits that could be used to buy boosts or different weapons for each mission. Or you could, of course, swipe that credit card and unlock things faster. Spartan Assault actually took a lot of flack and negative reviews because of its microtransactions, so they were removed in the Spartan Strike sequel. Both games were simulations of historical events controlled by a Spartan, with the first game taking place between the events of Halo 3 and Halo 4 and the second during Halo 2 and after Halo 4. Both received mixed reviews from critics with statements of it feeling like a 1980s arcade game with updated graphics and sounds. Replay value wasn't really there either, and things felt a bit too grindy. In Halo 5, 343 wanted to continue telling Chief's story, but not through his eyes. They wanted to explore what it was like to view Chief from others' perspective, and thus decided on the Spartan Lock manhunt. They really played up the Lock versus Chief dynamic as well to find the truth, but at no point in the campaign did you actually fight Lock or Master Chief. There's just a single cinematic with no interaction. To further amp up the backstory of Locke before launch, the Nightfall miniseries was released. Like Halo 4's Forward Unto Dawn, it was five episodes long of live action following Agent Locke and his own unit as they investigated terrorist activity and a biological weapon that was said to only affect humans. In game, you played as Locke for 80% of the campaign, which upset a lot of fans. Every soldier, when they hear about this, they're gonna hate us. You know that, right? On top of rarely playing as Master Chief, he was portrayed as an outlaw and as an equal in terms of combat effectiveness to Spartan Locke, despite Chief being physically and mentally superior in every way as a Spartan too, at least according to the lore. There was a lot of repetition in the campaign as well, having to fight the Warden Eternal six 
times. Allies were also supposed to be able to revive you, at least when the AI worked properly. Many felt like Halo 5's campaign experience and story was a complete step backwards. People also hated that there was no split screen local play anymore for the campaign or multiplayer. Microsoft's Phil Spencer came out and said, the vast majority of people, at least those whose consoles are connected to Xbox Live, are playing co-op across Xbox Live, not locally. We see the robustness of what Xbox Live is today and where people are playing across Xbox Live. You at your house, me at our house. We know that's the vast majority of the co-op play. With Halo 5, the team really wanted to focus on making that experience great, both visually on the screen that you're looking at and all the systems in place. He then went on to say, I love the nostalgia of the couch co-op of what Halo did in the past, but I also know in the realities of the day with people's busy lives, it's not as easy to get everybody in the same physical place. It's one of the advantages that Xbox Live obviously offers. People were now not only upset about campaign, but also that couch co-op was ripped out of a franchise that had had it for nearly 15 years. But hey, at least it looked good and played at 60 FPS now and was teen rated, right? Halo 5 eventually had a much more appealing force than Halo 4, but at launch, multiplayer was split into classic arena competitive play and this new thing called Warzone. Warzone wasn't just the large scale big team battle player versus player anymore. No, it added another layer with enemy AI objectives and capture points. The requisition point system was also integrated into Warzone with essentially loot box cards that you'd redeem for weapons or vehicles to call in while playing. These could either be purchased with real world money or unlocked for free with rec points, which would be acquired by, you know, just playing the game. Rarities of classic weapons and vehicles were assigned, which broadened the pool of available options, and we thankfully had more aircraft to choose from with the addition of the Wasp and Phaeton. However, cosmetics were locked behind the RNG rec point system as well, which some people absolutely hated. On the opposite end of the spectrum from casual Warzone play was Breakout. It was something different for the competitive crowd featuring single life elimination style rounds on very small maps that needed a lot of teamwork because grenades and weapons were so scarce. Armor abilities were replaced with Spartan abilities, which had no cooldown and could be used at any time. This included the thruster pack, ground pound, clambering, sliding, charging, sprinting, and smart scope for all weapons. Most seemed to prefer this over the pickups and loadouts that were seen in Reach in Halo 4. 343 really needed to prove themselves with Halo 5 after the evaporation of the Halo 4 online population and bug fest that was the Master Chief Collection. They seemed to get it partially right, with reception around multiplayer being generally positive, getting away from the loadout crap from Halo 4 and back to on-map pickups and power position control. The campaign, on the other hand, was met with a lot of criticism with how disappointing the gameplay loop and story were. If Halo 6 were to fail, it was looking like the end of the Halo franchise at the time. Before Halo 6 would be known as Halo Infinite, the sequel to Halo Wars came out, conveniently called Halo Wars 2. This time, it was available not only on Xbox One, but also PC. At launch, there were seven leaders to choose from, including Captain Cutter, Isabel, Professor Anders, and Sergeant Forge for the UNSC, and Decimus, Atriox, and Shipmaster for the Banished. Through some later DLC, the list of leaders would be expanded to a total of 16. There were some networking issues and ranked matchmaking wasn't available at launch, but most of the talk around the game was if the new Blitz game mode was pay to win, which it was. It combined elements from collectible card games with RTS gameplay by replacing base building with a card and deck mechanic. Decks were created from card packs earned through the campaign mode and daily challenges. Each unit had an energy cost where more powerful units required more energy. Energy would generate automatically throughout a match and more could be collected from pods dropped on the map periodically. The issue is that you could just buy card packs through microtransactions like in Halo 5 and farm up a deck of more powerful cards faster than us lowly peasants that were just trying to get them from playing the game. It was once again another bad look for 343. But at least the gameplay was addicting, fun, and simplistic in control just like the first game and it had more depth with unit interactions, game mechanics, and building that allowed for a variety of strategies. Of course, balancing had to be tuned, like with any competitive game, real-time strategy especially, but it was pretty bad at first, which turned away a solid chunk of the competitive community. As for the campaign, it once again followed the crew of the UNSC Spirit of Fire, but this time, instead of fighting against the Covenant, you engage with the Banished, led by a brute called Atriox. The story was pretty good, the cutscenes were beautiful, and it helped set up the story of the Banished for Halo Infinite. 
A few months after launch, a campaign DLC expansion called Awakening the Nightmare was released, letting you control banished forces against the Flood. Halo Wars 2 received generally favorable reviews for console, but mixed for PC, mainly because there were just better, more complex RTS games available on PC, and Halo Wars 2 was just nowhere near as deep in comparison. The gameplay was really fun and the campaign was good, but there were frequent bugs that sometimes caused crashing and mission events could fail to trigger. Regardless, it was considered to be a successful game despite all the microtransaction, card deck pay to win stuff. Halo Infinite was originally planned to be the end of the Reclaimer trilogy, but it's now been expanded to be more of a saga. With it being a live service, Infinite is going to be a portal of sorts, with future content coming in the form of DLC. At launch, there's campaign, theater, the boot camp shooting range, and multiplayer. Multiplayer is free to play for the first time ever in a Halo game, and the gameplay really gets back to its roots. Many fans consider Infinite to finally be a worthy successor to Halo 3 and Reach because of the gameplay, art style, level design, and soundtrack. Regarding gameplay, it's solid, with several new weapons like the Hydra, Commando, Skewer, Shock Rifle, Stalker Rifle, Disruptor, Pulse Carbine, Heat Wave, Center Shot, Ravager, and Mangler. Equipment makes a return with a new Drop Wall, Threat Sensor, Thruster, and Grapple Shot. Active Camo and Overshield have both also been moved to the equipment slot and must be activated to be used. Split Screen returns after its hiatus in Halo 5, but Campaign Co-op is not available at launch along with Forge, with expectations of those features to be released within 6 months after official launch. Prior to launch, Battle Pass progression in the beta is slow, and the monetization of armor customization combinations and colors feels restrictive and exploitative because of armor cores. I think pretty much everybody right now hopes to see some good developments on this as time progresses. As for the campaign, it follows Chief and his new AI nicknamed The Weapon as they explore Zeta Halo and the relationship between Chief, The Weapon, and Cortana. Oh, and of course, you'll kick some banished butt cheek along the way. I'll have the complete story of Halo Infinite's campaign as well as everything from the precursors and forerunners to the Flood, Covenant, Banished, Master Chief's past, the different Spartan programs and how all the campaigns tie together in a separate video, so remember to subscribe if you're interested in that and once it's live, I'll post it down in the comments. Let me know what I miss in this video or if there's something you really wish I would have covered. Thank you so much for making it through the whole thing and unlike those Xbox friends that were last online several years ago, I hope to see you again soon either out on the battlefield or in another video.